Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the occasional podcast that myself and my dear friend Kat from Supernatural Beatles do occasionally um, talking about uh, different topics. And lately, we've been kind of going through books of insiders in the uh, Beatles circle, um, just kind of getting a different look at at the characters, you know, um, who surrounded the Beatles, and it gives us a different look to the Beatles. So, yeah. Yeah. All good. Welcome, everybody, to Supernatural Powers. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Wish I had Supernatural Powers. How about you? Oh, geez. <laughs> what I could do. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to tell uh, teleport so I could like teleport anywhere. <laughs> what would you what would you like to have your supernatural power be? Oh, I'm not sure. It'd be knowledge based, I think, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I could probably handle it being omnipotent and omniscient and all of that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be quite a burden to uh, to carry, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, I'm going to be God. No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> If only, right? No, I wouldn't want to be God. I just want to get it over and done with. Yeah. This whole life cycling nonsense. So. <laughs> ready to go home. <laughs> I was ready to go home when I got here. That's what I'm talking about. I'm like ready to, yeah. Anyway, let's not digress. I think that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if there are any aliens out there, take us home. <laughs> take us back to where we belong. Yeah. So um, we're going to be talking about um, the book called The Last Days of John Lennon, and this book is by Mr. Fred Seaman. He was uh, basically John's assistant for the last couple of years of his life, and kind of served as a gopher for uh, Yoko as well. And overall, what, what was your... What's your opinion of this book? Just before we dive into it, what did you think about it? Well, before we dive into it, I'd like to point out that in the UK, hmm. the book has a different title. Okay. In the UK, it's called John Lennon, Living on Borrowed Time. Ooh. It is exactly the same book. I wonder why the different... <laughs> I mean, I, obviously, I know that's how they do it with records and stuff, too. They, That's just... That's odd. <laughs> they would give it two different names. Both essentially meaning the same thing, you know. Yeah, it's still the same thing. In fact, once you get into sort of the inside pages, it actually has the last days of John Lennon written on the inside. Oh, okay. So it's kind of weird. Interesting. Must be a publishing thing. Yeah. An interesting book. I, I tend to sort of generally trust Fred mm -hmm. in his account of his time with John and Yoko. I mean, first and foremost, it's essentially his memoirs of his time based on his diary entries. Right. So if he says that he did a thing, then he did a thing. <laughs> it just so happens that him doing a thing happened to involve John Lennon or Yoko. Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> oh, and we have learned from the previous book we read, you know, just what characters those two are, um, were, you know. Um, I find it very interesting, though, just the ties that Fred already had to uh, kind of John and Yoko, like his family, his uncle and his aunt were in their sort of inner circle, you know, I found that kind of interesting that um, his Aunt Helen was actually Sean's governess, you know. I... Well, that happened afterwards, I think. I, I think the connection was actually through Yoko. Really? I thought it was because John... No, it was because Fred's dad uh, knew Yoko. Yeah, he had produced some of her performances and stuff. That's right. Well, he was an impresario, wasn't he? And he was also... Um... A child protege, he'd studied at um, Juilliard, mm. and he was also interested in Egyptology. Yes. And so those were all the things that they had in common. And it was through all of that that Fred's dad knew Yoko. Yes. <laughs> and because Fred's birthday was the 10th of October and John Lennon's was the 9th, Yoko thought that was an omen. He was a 10. <laughs> yeah, it was an important part of him getting hired. I thought that was interesting. She says something like, 
you're a 10. <laughs> so we had to hire you or something like that. That's interesting. Always going by the numbers, right? <laughs> Always going by the numbers, yeah. He tells kind of the same story as John Green in the sense that, like, they're both extremely eccentric and extremely difficult and sometimes, like, infuriating to work for. Yeah. They're very highly strong. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And massive consumers as well. They consume a lot of things. They buy a lot of things. And half the time they don't even use them. Yeah, they have a whole room full of storage just to go and put all of the stuff that they bought in, never to be looked at again. I found that interesting as well. And how ironic it is when you think of this as the man who's saying, imagine no possession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, he, I think basically they were trying to fill a hole emotionally. Yes. Good call. Which is what a lot of people do, isn't it? They buy stuff. Yes. Because they're trying to make themselves feel better. Oh, yeah. Retail therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it, it doesn't really work. It just fills up a room and takes up a whole load of money off your credit card. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, but it's amazing the kind of things that like Yoko would spend her money on. Again, we spoke about that in the last time, just especially with her love of Egyptology and the occult. It's very fascinating <laughs> that they just had all this money to, you know, throw out at these ventures. It's very interesting. Yeah, I, I think it kind of, as a book, it kind of made me feel a little bit sad. Because hmm. John comes across as a very lonely figure. He does. He does. He really does. I, I like that bit where he says, uh, this is on page 41. It's like a bloody chess game, don't you see? I'm the king and every encounter with pawns weakens me. You're my knight. It's your job to protect me. Mm. And I think that's really sad. It is sad. Protect him from ordinary people. I know it. Oh, well, and that... Again, that also makes me think about, um, again, in John Green's book, how he talked about John's sort of recluseness and apprehensiveness to be out in the world. And yeah, I agree. I think it's very sad because he had a lot to give to people, you know, but I also think uh, Yoko was really keen on keeping him sort of isolated and reclused. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, lots of calls that came through for John, oh. including from Billy, Yeah, you know, as Paul, obviously. Right. They never made it through. Nope. Not even Julian, Cynthia. Yeah, it's... I And I think that's horrible. I think that that definitely plays into the toxicity of the, you know, possibility that she had him under some sort of hypnosis and that's kind of the vibe that Fred gives through this book is that you know he was under her thumb and she just pranced around and had affairs and did all these things you know told John that oh they couldn't have sex because if they had sex he couldn't awaken his kundalini <laughs> you know <laughs> vibe and stuff like <laughs> yeah just weird they just had a very odd dynamic and that's yeah thought that was a very main uh central theme to this book again um what a way to live yeah i i don't know absolutely yeah yeah i like the line um yoko's life revolved around her acquisitions but her most valuable acquisition was john yes <laughs> and then, bang <laughs> and then he, he go he goes into the whole um that that was part of yoko's faustian bargain right <laughs> yes oh that's probably my favorite bit, bit of the whole book she would become an appendage to his fame and so she just resented him for that you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, that was a very juicy bit of the book. Oh, like it's absolutely that that paragraph is absolutely my favorite. It was part of Yoko's Faustian pact that she had to keep John for better or for worse yeah. and remain an appendage to John's fame <laughs> um, and to the pervasive Beatles legend, no matter how much she craved independence and personal fame. It was no wonder that she bitterly resented John even though she was constantly conscious of the need to retain his loyalty. Without John Lennon, Yoko Ono was just an eccentric lady with no money and no power. 
and for this she would never forgive him. Oh, God, that like cuts like a knife. <laughs> that is the most important bit. If you've read that bit, you're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That says all that needs to be said. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, so I mean, no wonder that she had to like keep him like doped up you know, let it, well, she herself was doped up the whole time too, but you know, like, yeah, she had no problem with him just staying in his room stoned all day long, you know? And well, basically I think she was trying to get him out of her way. <laughs> exactly. That's what it felt like. I felt like, yeah. you know, she knew she could, um, she could never leave. Mm. She could never really get rid of him. Right. Um, so they were stuck together. But at the same time, she just wanted to be away. Yeah. Just doing her own thing. Clearly. So. <laughs> Getting involved. Yeah. <laughs> Such a, a toxic relationship, oh, God. really. And nothing like the mythology. No, nothing. No, nothing like it. And and that's also, again, another sort of sad element to me that they actually did not they didn't even really respect each other, you know, they... No, they wound each other up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, something I did find interesting in relation to John Green's book is, you know, how we were talking about the whole when Billy got busted in Japan and yeah, the different reactions, like you had briefly touched upon uh, what this book had said. What I find curious is that um, it was uh, John Green that did a magical ritual to make that bust happen. And he left that out of his book, but Fred Seaman included it in his book. He was the one that actually put that spell, quote unquote, out for Billy. Because I think Billy called and said that he was like staying at the... Um, hotel and was asking Yoko got like jealous about it yeah and like wanted to ruin his trip so she had John Green do this sort of because I guess he was a voodoo priest <laughs> and she had him do some sort of spell that's interesting because I don't really remember that bit you don't no no I even wrote it down in my notes I I, I, I don't even have a note about it that's how unimportant it was to me <laughs> I have notes about all of that, you know, being Billy as Paul, being kept away from John, them keeping files on Paul about their partners, about children and generally what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And then the arrest happens and John and Yoko were laughing at Billy's bad luck, but realized that it had kept them away. Right, the hotel. Kept Billy and Linda, that is, away from staying at their favorite hotel. And they were... They were really wound up that Billy and Linda staying there would sort of ruin the the energy and the environment of of the hotel. So I don't know what page it's on, but that's that that is something that he said. I even remember right. I have it down here in my notes because he also talks about how they hired a voodoo priestess to put like a spell on the judge for John's immigration hearing um, that like he carried a handkerchief full of like this horrible smelling ointment and was supposed to like put it under the table and, re you know, reveal the scent. And I guess the courtroom went in a tizzy because nobody could figure out where the smell was coming from. <laughs> Anyways. It ended up changing the judge's mind. Oh, I found it. It's It seemed that John Green, Yoko's hulking bearded tarot card reader, was also a voodoo priest, and he was supposed to cast a spell on Paul to prevent him and Linda from occupying the presidential suite of the Akura. Yeah. Whether or not it happened, he was meant to. So, yeah. To be honest, I, th I don't know if, if you need a spell, because if you walk through any Asian country with a load of dope, you're going to jail. <laughs> so no spell required. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought in that chapter, the way more interesting thing was where John was talking about, quote, having a magic formula for songwriting when he was in the Beatles. I looked at that and went, yeah, your magic formula, mate, was getting someone else to do it. Right. Yes. <laughs> for a very <laughs> long time. 
it's 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 winning isn't it you're winning with that formula i'll get someone who's a professional songwriter to write my songs mm. obviously he didn't do it his uh, superiors did exactly but, yeah <laughs> One hundred percent. Ghost writers. Good call. Good call. <laughs> there's there's lots of little bits where he refers to his time in the Beatles, and I and I just find all of them hilarious. Yes. So very interesting his interactions. Like he talks about LSD trips with like Graham Nash, and just I I agree. I find all those little antidotes pretty funny. Um, I don't know though. Um. One thing, though, that John said something about himself, um, he was like, I think, I don't know, they were um, away with Julian somewhere, I forgot the destination, but they were watching some sort of Jesus of Nazareth on the television, and John got like in a tizzy and started on a tirade against Christianity, and um he described himself as a born again pagan. <laughs> and then he said that he was, um, he described himself as one half monk, one half performing flea. <laughs> I <thought that> was, <laughs> okay. I thought that was brilliant. I just, you know, because just, yeah, his time in the Beatles definitely, I don't know, it just made me think of like a circus and. <laughs> what yeah. the Beatles were, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wonder where that was. But it kind of is interesting that he can... I know, I'm sorry I don't have the book in front of me to well, reference. Um, I know the bit... Um, that, that There's a bit around page 59 where he talks about Christ, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad were all messages of the Supreme Being. Yes, yes, I do remember and that then one. It, and fun. then it goes on to talk about uh, John when he was back in the in the Beatles in the mm. 60s, believing he was Christ. Yes. <laughs> yes, I wrote that down too in mine. <laughs> I suspect it's somewhere around that yes. one. Yes, I wrote that down actually. John, John was fascinated with the life of Jesus and thought he was Christ reincarnate in the late 60s. His mission was to spread peace, love, and enlightenment. <laughs> yes, I wrote that down. That's funny. Um... <laughs> He's a prophet, right? Prophet of... Prophet of something. Yeah. The Aeon of something. I don't know. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> not, not even that. I've, he long since gave up on that, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He became disillusioned with it all. I don't know. And I find, I found it kind of interesting to kind of get a glimpse into his relationship with Julian in this book. Because seems like Fred Seaman kind of bonded with Julian because he was like more in like Julian's age group kind of and it seems like John maybe I just think he bothered with him yeah paid attention to him because uh, May Pang had exactly the same sort of relationship yeah that's true she bonded with him as well in fact everybody bonded with Julian apart from John, John really yeah and Yoko and Yoko obviously <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, Yoko didn't get on with anybody. No. Yeah, it's just, it's sad to me, though. And, like, they know there's one part where he's talking about how John wanted uh, Julian to eventually have his journals that he wrote. You know, the journals that Fred Seaman eventually got uh, accused of stealing. And yeah. That was something that he wanted because, I guess, John... Uh, got some sort of manuscript from his own father uh, that explained how his aunt Mimi kept kept his father away from him, so he wasn't able to ever have that relationship. So I don't know. He, I guess he was able to forgive his father through that manuscript, and he kind of wanted Julian to maybe have that same experience one day. And I'm like, yeah, why don't you work on it when you know he's right in front of you? You have the time now to bond you know like are you gonna mm. wait for him to have your well, they, they did get on a little bit towards the end but I mean he kind of left it a bit late yeah it's just sad you know I, I find actually much more interesting is what happened to Fred out of all of that oh I know I feel really sorry for him me too I mean the prologue and the afterward oh, gosh. that talk about it 
Oh my God. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> he got beat up by some cops that moonlit for Yoko, you know, <laughs> getting threatened. And I don't know. Yeah, that was. Yeah, well, he got threatened. They took him back to his home. Yeah. Then they ransacked the place. They stole a whole load of stuff that yeah. actually had been legitimately given to him by John. Yeah. And then eventually, of course, he ends up in court. Bullshit. Terrible. Yeah, it's total bullshit. Yeah, I remember, like, they even took a picture that Julian had made me or something like that. He said something like that. Oh, it's. I don't know, just Yoko sending her paid off goons to try and deal with her business is shady in itself. You know, I, I don't know. She just, I, I really get the feeling that Fred Seaman does not like Yoko from this book. You know, he really does describe her as like a frigid, cold, unavailable woman you know to her mm. family and but why would he like her exactly <laughs> exactly like, look at what look at what she did to him never mind what she, he may have done exactly yeah it, right yeah <laughs> i mean he never had her beaten up nope and he never took her to court nope nope so what i find also very interesting is is that from John, there's a sort of acknowledgement of how crazy it all is. Hmm. And yet he won't do anything about it. Like right at the very beginning, when Fred first comes into their service, he goes through the kitchen service door. And then on the door, it says something like uh, Natopian Embassy. Yeah, Natopia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they knew. Oh, yeah. No. And he also, he John also said to Fred... That he had scrawled Helter Skelter on the wall. Yes. Before the white filing cabinets were installed. The file cabinets, yes. <laughs> the files that contained files of Paul McCartney's wives. <laughs> yeah, they, they kept know. files kept... on him. Yeah. But they yeah, seem to have kept so files funny. on a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's creepy. Very <laughs> creepy. They had their own little intelligence <laughs> center going on over there. Um, yeah, it's I it's very it's very true. It seems like John was kind of objective and was able to see kind of just how toxic things were, but I don't know. At the same time, I think he was as deluded as Yoko. I mean, just the way they lived, it's like no way to live with somebody, you know, to no. she's always afraid of him, you know, bursting out in anger. So she does her best to avoid him at all times. And it's just, I don't know. I, why did they stay together? Public face. You know, was it so Yoko had that power? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, plus, of course, I think she was hired to stay with him. Yeah. So. Definitely. <laughs> Yes. that <laughs> and that ties into like the whole yeah towards the end of the book when he gets shot and the way she acts afterwards you know it's just you know he said she was just ready for business you know days after she <laughs> was ready to get back to life as normal you know and yeah I mean it's a real contrast the way that yes her reaction is depicted in the book versus Fred's yes but she's she moves on very suspiciously quickly. Yes. Whereas Fred is absolutely in bits. He is heartbroken. Yeah. He puts the radio on and he hears number nine dream and he bursts into tears. And he's told that he better quit quit being sad and showing his emotions if he wanted to keep his job too. That's like something that shocked me. Like, wow, like the master of the house has just died, you know? Like what what are you supposed to think and feel, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That really did um, disgust me in a way. I think it's, and then just to the like scene, like when David Geffen was there, you know, doing like all these press conferences and he was talking about how he took a, all the money he was going to make now because he took like a million dollar life insurance policy out on John. That was curious to me. Like, how did he know to do that? Exactly. Exactly. And they had struggled to 
get a record deal, you know, when they were in the midst of making Double Fantasy and they finally signed with Geffen Records and then, you know, then he dies. It's very shady, very suspicious. Yeah. But everything leading up to that was suspicious. Like even when they were making that final album, Double Fantasy, there were so many times when things got put off. Yeah. Even though, you know, uh, Fred, I think in particular, had worked really hard recruiting musicians and booking studios and rehearsing and recording and all of that stuff that he'd arranged. Yeah. But then Yoko would say, no, it's not the right time because the numerology's wrong or the astrology's wrong <laughs> or she just couldn't <laughs> sing that day. <laughs> you know. She did coke the night before. Well, she did coke in front of everybody on an amp. Oh, oh, I know. Well, they, they <laughs> sent Fred to go get like four grams of it and expense it as candy or something like that for his daily expenses. Yeah, they were just totally out of it for that whole recording session. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it makes you wonder because yeah, obviously the, that album had to happen. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, she seemed to be directing when they were going and when they were coming back. Right. And that's important when you consider how he died. And she didn't want to beef up security when she was told repeatedly that they needed to beef up security. Yeah. 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 She gave people a day off, in fact. Yes. At exactly the wrong time. So suspicious. (laughs) Yes. And then, like, oh, that was creepy to me, too, that Fred Seaman said that he actually, like, met Mark David Chapman and was like, hey, you got a record signed by John Lennon. Good for you, bud, whatever, you know, and uh, that was kind of creepy. <laughs> but he also chatted with Jose Podomo, the doorman. Yes. Who yes. said that Chapman was not crazy. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I found that very... Because <laughs> he, he, he himself, and I know too, like in the tarot reading I did on that whole situation... He could have been the silent partner in the whole thing, you know, the one to, I don't know, give the signal for Mark David Chapman to do it. Or, you know, I feel like he was a plant there too, you know, with that whole situation. Yeah, maybe. I don't know what happened there, but uh, yeah, not, not good, obviously. But yeah, that was unsettling. Yeah. But yeah, it's, um very suspicious just the whole their whole relationship like like we had said you know it was all a grab for power for money for yoko you know and yeah i mean and the funeral plans and everything yeah like like he had no public funeral there were no flowers allowed um they were meant to make donations to the was it the Spirit Foundation yes. instead? Mm-hmm. And it and it was all very sort of hushed up when you consider what a public figure he was. Right. It's, especially with the yeah. outpouring of fans. And then uh, I did write down Yoko's media statement to that. And I found this kind of peculiar. She says, bless you for your tears and prayers. I saw John smiling in the sky. I saw sorrow changing into clarity. I saw all of us becoming one mind. Thank you. Love, Yoko. (laughs) Yes. That was a publicity line, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Promoting that oneness, right? Whatever. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's not a problem in and of itself. It depends on how you mean it. No. No, exactly. No. I totally agree with you there, but it's just, yeah, it's a very uh, contrite, like, hollow response, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, even Courtney Love gave a better sort of outpouring to (laughs) their fan, and Courtney Love is... And she was equally as fake. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) She also had a hand in her husband's death. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Oh, yes. Yeah, I just find it just bizarre, you know, how Fred was really suffering and even Ringo turns up, who can't do much, obviously. He's not really needed, Mm -hmm. you know. uh, Julian turns up for the cremation. And Mm. I think even then, Yoko doesn't bother with Julian. I think he actually stays with... 
Fred. I think don't don't they go he to does. um yeah. Cold Harbor? I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They do. She waited a very long time to tell Sean apparently. I don't know. That's another thing. Like Sean Lennon says that he was told like the day after, but then Fred Seaman says that she waited days. And that it was like a maddening situation to his Aunt Helen, the governess, because she wouldn't tell Sean what had happened. But Yeah, but he was like, what, five or something? Yeah, he was very young, very young. But um, I don't know. I just find, like, again, the water is always muddied with the myth and what actually happened. You know? No, but what, what I mean is, like, when you're five, you, you don't really recall things properly. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Like the timing of things. Right. You, re- you remember that something happened, but maybe not quite exactly when it happened. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good call. Yeah, I don't know. Um, like, what... So, I mean, like, between, I guess, the two, <laughs> as in, you know, being inside books to the Lennon, Yoko Lennons, their madness, which... Which book did you did you enjoy the most out of John Green and Fred Seaman's books? Uh, well, John Green's was an easier read, and it was quite fun. Yes. But that's more to do with the way that it had been written. Yeah. Um, Fred's is probably more informed. Yeah. But because um, there's a lot of one-on-one moments between John and Fred that are in Fred's book that, you know, aren't had anywhere else they can't be written anywhere else because they were very personal right like all the times they did drugs together for example i know i know (laughs) plenty of times (laughs) well i mean he turned into be john's buddy you know he even said that john didn't like boss him around you know he mostly was around to be the butt of john's jokes and to kind of be a companion, you know? Yeah, because John, and he even says it, doesn't he? Um, I don't have any friends. Yes. I thought I was really sad. John Lennon actually saying he doesn't have any friends. It is sad. Yeah, it's like, that makes me wonder, like, I thought I thought at least, like, him uh, and Ringo and George were, like, okay, but, I mean, maybe they even weren't close anymore, you know? Well, no, I mean, he'd sort of slightly fallen out with George, hadn't he, because of the book I, Me, Mine? Oh, okay. Okay, I I wasn't aware of that. And and Ringo, I think he always regarded as his sort of child, <laughs> which, is, which is sort of, I don't know, slightly insulting. It is. They were born the same year. But it always seemed like John was, like, the most proud of Ringo in his, like, solo success. I don't know. Yeah, no, he definitely was. One thing that I got through this whole thing, though, is just how much John, like, hated Paul, Billy. You know what I mean? Like, he just had this, like, annoyance for him almost to the point of, like... Well, I know, but that only makes sense once you understand that Paul is actually Billy. Exactly. And that Billy has taken the place of his actual friend, Paul. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Uh, once you understand that, then then the grievances make a lot of sense. It does, because it it doesn't. You're exactly right, and that's um, something that I've read like with reviews of these books and stuff that people don't understand why he had such a hard time with Paul. You know, with as close as they were. But it, yeah, you're exactly right. It when you put it into perspective and know all sides of the story, <laughs> it's kind of obvious. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bit, I'll see if I can find it, where he talks about needing Paul when he was younger because he had a stable home life. Do you remember that bit? I don't know. Ah, yes. I found it. Okay. Um, Yeah, he talks about the friendship he had with Paul and needing him because he was musically very gifted and he had a stable home life. And that he was upset when he left him for Yoko, which is an interesting way of describing it. It's a very interesting way of describing it. And well, in the way that they always talked about their relationship in those terms, they're like, we're getting a divorce, <laughs> you know? He also says in that same little bit when he's talking about the Beatles that Pete, as in Pete Best, Pete gave Paul competition in the pretty face department. <laughs> That's a direct quote. 
I think feet fest and Ringo look very similar. So I would beg to differ. <laughs> they had that kind of moody look. That was the general kind of thing that a memoir says, though, too. Like, Pete Best uh, gave them a run for their money, so he had to go, you know. <laughs> yeah. But that, that does seem to check out when you actually yeah. look at the uh, sort of uh, other, if you like, normal Beatle books where they interview people who went to the Cavern Club before the Beatles were famous. Hmm. Yeah, that does seem to have been true. People loved him. And when Ringo came on, there were people who were like, would cackle him in the crowds telling, you know, bring Pete Best back. And (laughs) yeah. Oh, well, they got over it, didn't they, in the end? (laughs) (laughs) I think they did. Didn't take them long. No, it didn't. (laughs) Yeah, it's just. Okay, I don't know. I, I, I have to say I like John Green's book more. Um, I agree with you with the whole aspect of Fred Seaman's, you know, point of view being it was a journal. So, and, and the personal interactions he had with John. But I find Yoko to be such a fascinating character that to find out more about her and her ways, I, I don't know. I think I enjoyed John Green's take. And I, I don't know if that's because I'm, a tarot reader and I can kind of like appreciate what he went through <laughs> with her. You know, just, <laughs> ugh, I couldn't, I mean, I can't even imagine having somebody like that all the time, you know? Yeah. There, there isn't as much in the way of occult references, but there are some. Yes, there are. There are. The, the, there are some in this book, like um, when they're on holiday in Palm Beach, um, February, 1980, they go to an occult bookshop. Yes. And they're talking about uh, Madame Blavatsky's um, practical occultism. And John says that he had an interest in theosophy, Mm. but most of what he read was intellectual masturbation. (laughs) That's what he called it. such a John Lennon thing to say. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Well, actually, it it reminded me of um, the German ideology by Marx and Engels, because actually they say something very similar. I think it's something like Mm. philosophy and the study of reality have the same relationship to each other as sexual love to masturbation. (laughs) And I wondered if you'd read that, because I'd read that. No, I... I... (laughs) I don't recall that, but that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I like that. Um, it seems that John dropped a lot of his esoteric knowledge on Fred, and Fred seemed kind of in awe of him about that. You know, I, I did get that kind of vibe throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I like all the stuff about sailing. Oh, gosh. But I, I, I quite like anything sort of maritime i'm that way inclined Mm, do you yeah i do and i I like that they they go they go to that boat that i think is owned by fans and it's called imagine yeah yeah i think that was that was uh wonderful well it's neat because it's like john is in his element and he has to sort of face his fears right and has to yeah yeah yeah. well they borrow a boat don't they and that's called isis hello (laughs) And that was like a training vehicle. hey Yeah. And then he goes on another one, doesn't he? Um, Megan J, I think it's called. That's the one that he actually sails to Bermuda. Yeah. That's where he had his... And gets in the storm. Yes. Yes. But it seems that storm did him some good. I don't know. When he went to Bermuda, that's when all the ideas for double fantasy... Yeah. That was one of the two really big things. One, The first one was they were in the car, John and Fred. Mm. And Billy's song coming up came on the radio Mm. and a sort of creative sibling rivalry (laughs) was sparked in John. So that kind of put a fire under him Mm. that made him want to write again. And the other thing was being in that storm and almost dying at sea. Yeah. And it it revivified him. Dead. And then he started writing loads and loads of songs and trying to play them down the phone to Yoko because she wasn't there. And and she was not bothered at all. No, nope. <laughs> she's like whatever. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, I have to be a producer on this album. You know, I have to put my music on it too. <laughs> you know, just that's all yeah. she cared about. Yeah, 
And she hadn't even bothered writing anything until the last minute. Nope. Nope. No, she just didn't care. She just threw something together. It's like, well, I'm brilliant, so it's going to be fine. I love how he talked <laughs> about um, how her uh, overdubbing was a nightmare because she could never sing in key. <laughs> so it, and he talked, yeah, they went that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> that made me laugh. <laughs> so I can just see her, ah! you know, the way she yeah sings yeah <laughs> yeah anyway yeah and, and every time that she showed a total lack of interest in in john's creative projects or mm. progress he just sort of went off on one like they went off he and fred to mm. do magic mushrooms or go to a disco or yep. get drunk or whatever just it's like, ah, oh, screw you. We're off. You know, we're going to go and have fun. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it is kind of cool because it's like Fred seemed to be John's buddy, you know, like he oh, was yeah, absolutely. his hired friend in a way. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that's kind of cool. And that 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 does speak to John that he wasn't he wasn't like Yoko treating people like servants, you know, even though Fred was his assistant. No, not at all. He was like down to hang out with them, wanted to know him personally. And I respect that, you know, I, <laughs> I don't like the whole idea of how Yoko just like looks down on everybody who works for her and acts like they're just objects. Yeah, it was kind of interesting, that little bit where everything's going wrong for Fred. He has a whole load of stuff to do before they go on a trip to Long Island. And one of the things he has to do is pick up Yoko's mother. Her mother, yeah. Who is, <laughs> by all accounts, a much nicer, more centred person than Yoko. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's what came across to me anyway, because she was quite kind to Fred. She was. But then they couldn't understand why like, I, he was late or something and it caused a big tizzy with, I don't know, John was like waiting anxiously for him to arrive. And um, that's what I remember about that, that scene. But it was good, you know, when, when John finally snapped out of his uh, long depression and started being creative again. And, and Fred talks about that, you know, that he says. Yes. Yes. Uh, that he finally saw the John Lennon that he knew existed. Yes. Hidden beneath layers of, of boredom and despair. Yes. And brainwashing and hypnosis. I mean. Ugh. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he can't talk about that, though, no, can he? No, he can't. But he subtly, <laughs> he subtly puts it in there. So it's like read between yeah. the lines, right? Like Absolutely. It's kind of obvious. Yeah. And yeah. I just feel so bad for John that he had to live his last years you know the way he did like i don't know it seemed like when he was with may Pang, even fred said that like he was you know full of life and he was fit and yeah he was partying and stuff but he had his shit together basically but then as soon as he came to yoko it was like he turned into like a shell of himself and that was something that I think Fred met him when he came back from his lost weekend with May Ping. Yeah. Yeah, it was around that time. But he saw like pictures and saw the he noticed the difference, you know, and that was just sad to me. She like sucked the life out of him. But then, you know, there's some curious things that Fred says about his first marriage. Hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, he's not, he's not he's not exactly complimentary. No. You know, he, he says that, well, Fred says that John said that Cynthia um, had trapped him in their marriage by getting pregnant. Yeah. Like somehow she did it to herself. And that he, he lived a bachelor <laughs> life, you know, d despite he, him having a young child and wife at home. Yeah. It's kind of sad. Yeah, it is sad. And... Cynthia had a really rough time. Oh, God. That's all I can gather from all of this. She got the short end of it, definitely. Definitely did. Yeah, she definitely did. Because, I mean, Julian at least spends some time with John and his new family. Mm. And he gets on surprisingly well with Sean, which he still does. Yeah. Uh, which was really good. It's nice to see that. Yeah, it is really nice. Um, And John... I don't know. He, he talks a little bit about 
his time as a child. Mm. He he talks about um, he had once had a, a thought of being a fashion designer. Yes, but he didn't want he didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to come across as gay and a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? I found that so hilarious when I read that. <laughs> but but kind of disturbing. He also talks about like when he was like nine or something, he learned to put himself into a hypnotic state mm. by staring at himself like in the eyes in a mirror until he started seeing um hallucinatory images of his face changing. Wow. Yeah. I mean that's that's a bit screwed up, isn't it? It is a bit screwed up. And, it's... and funnily enough, it's something that also gets mentioned in the memoirs of Billy Shears. Yes, that's true. Oh, shit. Yes. You know, because it yeah. recommends you try it unless you're, you know, unhinged, in which case it says <laughs> don't bother. May not be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, that's true. I never, I didn't even make that connection. It's just fascinating. I, I enjoy, I enjoy these like inside looks to the celebrities, you know, by people who were around them. Um, yeah, because you're you're getting a different view, aren't you? Yeah, and it takes them off of the pedestal. You know, it shows you that they're just as messed up as we all are, and they all have their issues and problems. Nobody is perfect. There is no such thing as perfection in any individual, you know. Mm. But it's just a very sad reality that he lived in for the last yeah. few years of his life. And I, w I wish that he had better. I think he deserved better, you know. I don't know. I go back and forth. No, he didn't deserve the, the, uh, the life he was presented with, uh, almost forced into. Yeah. But... Um... I don't know. There's always a bit of me that sort of says, well, why didn't you just go away? Why didn't you walk away? Mm. Why didn't you? Is the mind control that deep? I don't know. I think it is, honestly. I think that's something that is the deal with Billy, too. It's, uh, it even says in the memoirs that he feels guilty of his servitude. You know, it's not something that they, like you said, were forced into somehow. And I don't know exactly. I would love to know John's story like how he got put into the fold of the like secret society and all that jazz. They were on a flight back from Bermuda to New York and they ended up circling around New York. For some reason, they couldn't land. Mm. They were trying to get into JFK Airport. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's kind of, that whole scene is quite funny because they're watching the BG Sergeant Pepper film yeah. on the flight. Yeah. And John found that really funny. Yeah. And meanwhile, Yoko is panicking out of her mind because she's convinced that they're going to crash and die. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she's evil on the plane consulting a numerology and tarot and astrology, trying to think of, you know, will it be okay? Will, will we die on this plane? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, listen, Yoko, just calm down it'll be fine right <laughs> that's hilarious yeah the Bee Gees. oh i've never watched that movie i need to watch it though i definitely do i i have it's a really bad movie <laughs> <laughs> it is the o the only thing that i like about it is the bit at the end um with billy preston mm. oh billy preston's yeah. awesome Yes. He is awesome. Yeah. I love him. I do too. Um, he's really good at the end. I like his bit, but all the rest of it, yeah, I could live without. <laughs> yeah, it's never really <laughs> appealed to me. So I've, I've never been a Bee Gees. My parents have loads of Bee Gees uh, albums in their collection, and I've always just skip, skip. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, anyway. When they come back from Bermuda, mm. John says that he started having dreams mm -hmm. about having a violent death. Yes. And I just thought, now, huh. are these sort of dreams that have been implanted or did he actually see his own death in his dreams? Is it like Paul's dreams? Right. You know, because Paul was meant to have had all those dreams about dying, Is but I suspect they were actually, you know, mind control program mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, yeah, I, very interesting. I definitely think, because he also said to Fred, there are no such things as accidents, <laughs> you know, uh, in relation to those premonitions he had. So that could definitely be some sort of programming. Uh, yeah. Like telling John to accept his fate in a way, kind of like Paul. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I reckon so. That whole chapter was kind of weird. Yeah, it it is. Um, it, I I have wonder though if John had a feeling that you know something was gonna happen to him. You know what I mean? Like, in if he, you know, he had these premonitions of having a violent death. But do you get what I'm saying? Like, I wonder if he actually knew if something was. Yeah, well, that's what I wonder. Well, yeah. How how much of that was programmed? Mm. And how much of that was like his higher self or yeah. whatever you want to call it, like saying to him, you're in danger. Yeah. You you need to get away from here. Right. right. Oh, I really wonder. Yeah, that's so. a great, a great point. It's very, yeah. it's freaky, you know, and it, it makes me again, very sad for him. Very sad for Paul. <laughs> Just they uh, became liabilities, I guess in a way and I don't know it, yeah it's crazy I know Nixon wanted him out of the picture you know that yeah him winning his immigration uh, suit didn't help things at all you know and that he just posed too much of a threat because too many people followed him and worshipped him basically and they knew that yeah exactly right yeah I don't know what bits I've missed. <laughs> I'm still going backwards and forwards. I, I do know I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the very few times that he seems to have only very briefly hmm. fallen out. Um, Fred falling out with John, I mean. Hmm. Is um, John and Sean's birthday. Yeah. They have a party. And Fred wears a T-shirt that says sycophantic slave. Yes. And John and yes. Yoko are both quite offended by that. Yes. He was only wearing it as a joke. It's kind of true anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> Didn't he also like freak out uh, when he, uh, Fred let Julian drive like the three, the $30,000 Mercedes that they had? Um, I remember some, I think that was when they were up in Cold Harbor together. Mm. And John flipped his wig, <laughs> like, what are you doing letting a punk teenager drive that, you know, expensive piece of machinery, you know, and just making a huge deal out of it. But he didn't drive it much, did he? Um, that was the only time. No, but that's the only time I, I recall him, like, yelling at him. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, going back to cars, at the beginning of the book, mm. at the beginning of Fred's time with with uh, John and Yoko, he's driving a really clapped out old car mm. that, that barely starts. Yeah. And I'm sort of thinking, well, why? I mean, this is, this is their car that he is driving on their behalf. Right. And they've got loads of money. Yeah. So, I mean, they waste most of it. Why didn't they buy a better car? Well, I think, I think Yoko told him to bring her like catalogs of like, all the fancy new cars that, and I think they got like the first Mercedes station wagon. Yeah, but why did they? Why did they have that car in the first place? Yeah, I don't know. That's what I mean. I know they got a better one eventually. Were they trying to play poor? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know, but they they have lots of uh, funny little quirks. Yes, they do. <laughs> I love the little bit where he they talk about um having past lives and being um, Egyptian royalty. Yes. <laughs> like, of course you were. Well, isn't that what she bought that sir sarcophagus for? Yes. You know, just because she thought she that was her in a past life. But then she's like, it's too ugly to have been me. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Yeah. It's a vanity. Really weird. It is. Yes. She is incredibly oh, vain. Goodness. Yes. It's amazing. It's just also, like, the way she would uh, flaunt, speaking of, the way she would flaunt her herself, you know, when she when she wanted to make an appearance, she made an appearance, right? And would dress very provocatively. 
But then also there were times where she was just like strung out on heroin and just looked a total wreck. Yeah. Well, I mean, after she had Sean, I think she was thinking of trying to get pregnant again yeah. and then she became menopausal and then she started doing loads of heroin because yeah. I think she just thought, ah, well, screw it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get rid of hot flashes, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, don't. But her, her family, I, I found very interesting. Yes. Because sometimes they're written up like they're very standoffish. They're only really interested in John's money, mm -hmm. but not really in him. Mm -hmm. And then other times they seem to be much more centered, like, you know, th than, than Yoko. Just quite different people. Kinder. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And kinder. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's the thing that makes me think about because she, I think Yoko said she's always been the black sheep of her family. Yeah, that's right. So that makes total sense, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it, um, I got the feeling from like John Green's book that they were, like you said, very pretentious and you're not Japanese, so I don't care about you kind of. Yeah, because I, I know that they didn't. I mean, they didn't want to talk to Julian, but they did no, talk right. to Sean. Yes, because he was half Japanese. Because yeah. he's half Japanese. Yeah. 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 I mean, I know they had a communication problem because their English was not great. Right. Um, and obviously, uh, Julian didn't know Japanese, although John did know a little bit. Hmm. Seems like he, you, you could see him picking up little bits of Japanese mm. um, because I think he cottoned on to the fact that if he didn't make that kind of an effort, then no one would talk to him. <laughs> yeah, because they would always constantly talk in Japanese, no English. Yeah, and that used to drive them crazy. Yeah, I, I crazy stuff. See, uh, Fred makes quite a few references to that in, in a couple of different areas of the book, I remember. He says something like they were chittering in Japanese or chattering to him in Japanese. I don't know, something like that. I do remember something about i don't know where it is but i do remember something about him shouting that you know do i have to speak japanese just to be able to communicate with my own wife yeah. or something because she was ignoring him <sighs> it's just when her family were around the japanese is i love that yeah i love that too <laughs> i think that's brilliant i just don't know how he lasted so long around her but it, it could only be mind control <laughs> i mean really i just I don't think it's only love's gonna cut it with this one. No, um, I I like all the times that they got high together. I know I've mentioned that before, mm. but I I like I like that when they were smoking dope together or doing magic mushrooms together. They are funny, yeah. And and then were totally incapacitated for the next day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were fun to to read. Definitely, just I again it, it's. It's nice to get that kind of feel that John... Yeah, well, basically you saw them blowing off steam, you know, because everything else was so tense all the time. And just every now and again, they would just go, right, oh, we can't do this anymore. We have to actually relax. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, before we, like, burst. Ugh. Again, <laughs> no way to live. No way to live. I mean, blow off steam, yes, but, like, to always be in tension and discomfort and, yeah... Any more points? Oh, yeah. One one thing that I thought was kind of weird. I guess it must have been when they were in Bermuda or, or something to do with that trip. No, I think it was Cold Spring Harbor. And it was that chapter. John does a 10-day vowel of silence. That's right. <laughs> and Sean is so confused. He's like, why is my daddy not talking to me? Yeah. And people are trying to explain it to him. You know, his um his two uh babysitters, Udasan and, and Helen. Yeah. And even Fred. They're trying to explain it to him, but Yeah. He's, he's like what, four or five? He doesn't understand. That doesn't make sense. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's funny. The different things that they would you know, the different ventures they would go off on, you know, just like doing Mm. A vow of silence or the, the kundalini yoga or the, you know, reading all yeah. the occult books or, or buying all of the books in all the bookshops. And 
yeah it's just it was always and all the tapes as well yeah it was and looking for reggae not where it's actually from <laughs> i know <laughs> <laughs> they're on bermuda and looking for reggae and they're like no you, you need to go to like jamaica or, or, what are you what are you doing here like why didn't you <laughs> sail down to jamaica yeah then you could have gotten some good grass while you're down there too you know <laughs> yeah that's funny it's just funny because it's like extreme you know it just seems like they're always doing things to the extreme and they never like half-assed it they only half-assed it when it came to their like relationship you know and their communication with each other but everything else was like indulgence and greed and just like we talked about buying stuff just for the sake of buying it you know it's yeah <laughs> oh i know something i want to talk about i have thought about it mm. i've just seen it um the episode where um it's yoko's birthday mm. and they go and buy her uh, a big cake and lots and lots of flowers and the idea is that they're going to fill the room with flowers <laughs> So that when she comes down, I think, to the lounge or wherever it is, that she'll see them and she'll be, like, overwhelmed by them. Right. And in order to do that, they have to pick up the flowers in the middle of the night. <laughs> and so they have to arrange at a florist to pick up hundreds of flowers in the middle of the night. So the day comes and it's her birthday and she's really not very impressed. Nope. And they couldn't work out why she wasn't. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, it's great. I'm, I'm, it's, it's fantastic. It, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And then at the end of the chapter, you understand why she's not particularly pleased. And it's because they, they picked a flower that's used as a funeral flower in Japan. The lily or something, <laughs> right? No, gardenia. A gardenia. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, they just bought her hundreds of funeral flowers. <laughs> oh, that's right. She couldn't even just act a little bit, you know, oh, but... Oh, what a nice thought. What a nice sentiment. It's just, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. She just seemed to, like, take things for granted. I don't know. It seemed like John was always trying to make some sort of, like, gesture to her and to get her attention. Like, look at me. Look at me. I'm over here. You know, I'm, or I'm still here. Mm. She just didn't care, you know. And that, again, makes me sad for John, you know. Just... Mm. I don't know. He was better off with May Pang. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> he was better off with May Pang. They even saw UFOs together. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he told Fred about all that. I, rem I remember reading that. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be moving on to May Pang next and her ventures with John. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> see how that. Oh. There's a lot of sex no. in that book. Have you read no. it? No. Not at all. At all? So. Okay, well, that's a lot of sex in that book. Well, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> You've got to, if I have to drudge through it, I'll drudge through it. <laughs> well, there you go. Anyway. Well, it's been fun. Giving a little summary of the book and what we thought. I enjoy doing this stuff. It's fun. And we, as always, like, would like to know what you guys have to think about, what you guys have to say about. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know. The stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, if you've read the book, let us know, you know. All right, then. We will see you guys in the next one, hopefully. Yeah. See you next time. All right. <laughs>